Hi everybody, this is Dave Vellante. Welcome to Cube Conversations. Within the Wikibon community, there's a lot of discussion around replicating public cloud capabilities, particularly scale and agility inside of the private cloud. I'm pleased to have Rich Napolitano here. Rich is the CEO of Plexi, longtime friend. Rich, welcome back to the Cube. It's good to see you again. Great to be here. Dave, so it's a pleasure. you guys have had a busy, busy year so far. It's only, only opening day in April and uh, here we are. Uh, you guys have new funding announcement, new product announcement. Um, Give us the update. Now, uh, uh, again, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, so just for the record, for everybody uh, outside of uh, the East Coast, it snowed last night, and so it was a pretty snowy day on uh, April 5th, uh, opening day for the Red Sox, so go Sox. Uh, they plowed the field this morning, so uh, they're out there right now. Um, but uh, we're hardy here in New England, so that doesn't stop us. No and, and, and Plexi's continued to march on. Uh, in January, we announced uh, a new investor, uh, Google, um, and Google's uh, been following the company for some time, actually, and <clears throat> excuse me, we announced uh, the investment in January. And, and if you talk to the Google investment people, they, they would tell you that uh, it's really a statement of architecture, that Plexi uh, really has the right network architecture for the future, for really for the third platform. Our ability to scale, our ability to be software-defined, our ability to shape the infrastructure around applications in data is, is what they fundamentally saw. So when, when Google, I don't know how much you can say, but when Google makes such investments, it's looking at how it can apply such technologies to its own business, is that right? Or yeah, perhaps is it more looking as a sort of an investment vehicle? Or it, how do, how do I mean, well, this? it's Google Ventures, so they're, they're interested in making money. It's, uh, it's no accident. Uh, there's certainly an opportunity you know, inside the company. That wasn't the main impetus uh, for it. They, they want to shape the ecosystem of the world to be uh, more fluid and more cloud-like, whether it be public or private. And that just creates uh, an ecosystem which they can monetize in many different ways, including from the investment perspective. Okay, so also big announcement. Um, <coughs> you've announced that what you, you call the industry's first programmable network fabric for converged infrastructure and storage environments. So let's, let's unpack that. What does that all mean? Yeah, so I mean, we've learned a lot. Uh, my uh, around 18 months tenure now with the company, and we're, you know, last year was our first year of significant revenue growth, and we're very pleased with those results, and expect an even bigger year this year. But we we now know really the nature of the customer, and uh, the nature of the customer are these cloud builders, and they're building clouds, and in particular, they're building either the service provider part, uh, customers that we have are building big service-oriented networks, or private clouds, and so. What people are trying to do is uh, create agile, dynamic, flexible private cloud infrastructures that give them the same agility they would have in the public alternatives. And so Plexi represents a technology, a building block that allows them to build these private clouds that are as agile and flexible as public. So a lot of people uh, <clears throat> look at cloud as a, a place to store data or run apps, as a destination, if you will. What we see is, is really the business impact of cloud is about the operating model. Correct. How how are you and your customers affecting the operating model in a, in a cloud context? Uh, and that's a really great question. I think really the essence of uh, the strongest part of our value propositions. Uh, you know, we have a CapEx savings. If you look at it, you know, on our architecture, you have 90% less cables, one third less devices. But really the big saving comes from the operating expense because our network is really invisible to the application invisible to the operating environment. So, you know, we're so well integrated into the VMware environment that the network is really shaped around the VMware cluster. Our, we're so well integrated into, you know, various flavors of Hadoop, Hortonworks is part of our announcement, Cloud Hour as well, where we can shape the network and therefore compute and other resources around the application and data. So, automatically, which means you're not provisioning networks in bandwidth and trying to restrict flows at every, every client in a network to ensure the, your overall SLA, the network is shaping itself dynamically through software control, automating these manual processes through DevOps, through, you know, think about, I mean, in essence what we are, our founder says this a lot, Dave Husak, we're an API driven network. You can program our network to behave differently, to be shaped around your data and your applications as a huge office. So this really is all about the infrastructure <clears throat> as code theme. I know you like data, so we just put out a, a, a report on, we call it true private cloud, kind of tongue-in-cheek because a lot of the private clouds out there, we call them cloud-washed. <laughs> but we quantified that there's about, over the next 10 years, about $200 billion that is going to shift from non-differentiated you know, infrastructure management into vendor R&D. 
Mm -hmm. That's really your, your business. Mm -hmm. That is our yeah. business, certainly. Okay, so yeah. talk about that a little bit in terms of how that's affecting organizations in terms of their skill sets and how they should think about moving forward. There, you know, in fact, I mean, it's interesting that you, you bring this up. We, we know we have a, a, a really hot prospect when they latch on to our highest level of our value proposition, which is really DevOps. When they start talking, when they start understanding that they can program our network seamlessly, when they can manipulate our network through software to meet their overall, overall SLAs, that's when we win. We just, we don't need to say much else. They almost, they almost self, they self identify, but they self um, actualize in terms of really understanding the value proposition. So that's, um, and that, everyone is trying to automate. And so, because they need to take these manual steps. It's precisely, our network is not managed as a group of individual devices, as individual devices. Our network is managed as a network. So when you program our network, our APIs work across the entire network. So if you set up a VLAN between California and Tokyo, you're not touching the hundreds of devices in the network. You're just telling the network that you want a VLAN from here to here. That has huge implications because the alternative is touching hundreds of potentially devices in your network and programming through a CLI or typing into a CLI, which is extremely error prone. And, and some of the kind of traditional networking players will create kind of an overlay script that overlays the CLIs on all these devices, mm -hmm. and they think that that's automation. That's not automation, right? Our, our metadata for our network is fully distributed and is accessible to our APIs. So we've really elevated the conversation up away from the device to the network as an, as an entity that is programmed. And that's your, your kind of your why mm -hmm. is to enable that new operating model that we were just talking about. Okay, so now, Talk a little bit more about the what. What is it that you guys actually deliver and sell? So, so we, uh, we build networks uh, and uh, you know, layer one, two, three uh, networks. It's manifested in hardware, either white boxes or our own custom hardware. And for the right use case, you use, uh, they have different properties and different price points. So, uh, but really we're a software company. Uh, we have a, just a couple of hardware people that do all of our hardware. Uh, some of it ODM from other manufacturers. Um, our core IP is in two places, Plexi Control and Plexi Connect. Plexi Control is our, our SDN, it's the only time we use that word, we generally don't use that word, SDN controller, which allows us to manage the entire network as one entity. Also it does the, gets these requirements for your network from Plexi Connect, which we'll talk about in a second, and then fit and renders these topologies to allow you to adapt the network around your data and your application. So all of a sudden now compute and storage resources become fluid underneath this network. So you can move them around very, very easily. And the thing that drives that is Plexi Connect and their integrations into these, into these operating environments. So VMware, OpenStack, Cloudera, Hortonworks, you know, other, other operating environments, um, Mesos, even a whole sweep, sweep of DevOps tools. We have an integration even into Slack, which that whole community is evolving very, very quickly around a set of industry standards. That is our way into our product. So you can Python, RESTful interfaces, leveraging industry standards uh, into us that, that we feed into our controller, then we can fit and render these topologies and manifest them on these physical networks. So talk a little bit more about the, the business problem that you're attacking today, <clears throat> particularly as it relates to network traffic, how network traffic has changed. Everybody talks about north-south versus east-west, but you're going a step further. Can you unpack that a little bit for us? Sure, I mean, the driving ten, and this is again a lot of the revelation that we've had the last 12 months, is that um, when we think about people transitioning from platform to client server, uh, hierarchical infrastructure, right? Clients, a LAN, server, a SAN, and storage. That's the hierarchy we've been living in in platform two. And the nature of those networks was heavily north south. <clears throat> As people have transitioned now into platform three, they're heavily focusing on converged infrastructure. And so the converged infrastructure, one of the first things that modern converged infrastructure uses, uh, f does, is they remove the fiber channel SAN. And the moment they take the fiber channel SAN, they move all that traffic that used to be on the SAN and in the controllers and put it in on their IP network. And we're seeing you know, uh, a growing problem in these networks because suddenly the networks that were designed 20 years ago for north-south traffic from client-server era are now being populated with a huge amount of east-west traffic, you know, eight to 10 times the amount of traffic, and also now the metadata that's used to manipulate these storage subsystems now is on that network, which is extremely latency sensitive, and it must, the integrity of that data must be protected. So that determines 
the, the performance of your entire system now is determined by your network. You know, as a storage guy for a long time, as you know, you know, we solved the latency problem in storage with Flash. But now we've just created this new set of problems, which is the moment we converge infrastructure and removed our SAN, now the network is a new, the next new bottleneck. And we need networks that can adapt. So our integrations for you know, vSAN or Scale.io or Nutanix or SimpliVity and others allow us to dynamically shape the network to allow to avoid congestion. So all different types of traffic, north, south, east, west, metadata management, uh, recovery traffic for a back-end storage subsystem, um, the various stages of Hadoop processing uh, can be separated on the network and avoid these, these hotspots that we call micro, um, uh, you know, uh, micro burst in the network where you have a hotspot in your network that you really can't see because you, you think you have enough bandwidth in your entire network, but there's so much traffic north, south, and east, west that you create these very, very high latency uh, spots in your network. So it's like whack-a-mole. Every time you change something in an architecture, a new problem jumps up. But talk about a specific example. Let's take Nutanix, for example, where you've got you know, converged <coughs> infrastructure, hyper-converged infrastructure. Isn't the network capable within that system of, of handling this problem? Or where does it break down? Explain that. So whether it be Nutanix or vSAN or other things, they, uh, or even for that matter, just any classic could do, they all have the same challenge, which is if, you, if everything is kept within a rack, you don't have a problem. As you go to the second rack, you probably don't have a problem because there's not much east-west. As you go to your third rack and beyond, as you achieve scale, uh, as you want to stretch it elastically, geographically, then you, run, then you run into these challenges. And so you won't see these challenges until you, uh, you go beyond the first rack or third rack, and then you begin to scale. And, and suddenly, um, you realize you just can't throw bandwidth and buffers at these problems, that, that what you need is a dynamic network. This comes back to the original premise, which is that you know, the, the hierarchical infrastructure from platform two, client server, was very static. And what you need, and, and you could build that infrastructure and then pour data and, app, data and application into it. In this new world, the data sets are so large, they're growing so quickly, the applications grow so quickly, they all scale horizontally, and what you, you can't just build the infrastructure and pour data and applications in. You need the infrastructure to be built around you. You hear people talking about bringing compute to the data. Mm -hmm. That's another way of saying, I need to shape the infrastructure around the data. And so the idea that you'd build a static network that's hierarchical and rigid is so 20 years ago, right? Because the applications and the, and the data sets are so large and growing that the infrastructure needs to be dynamic around that. And that's what a lot of the web skill guys learned a long time ago. Because you're not moving the data. You ain't moving the data. Yeah. And these applications are growing horizontally so quickly that you can't pre-engineer the network anymore. The day you cable a network, hierarchical network, your bandwidth, latency, and everything about your network is determined. And that, that, that does not support this idea that you need to build a private cloud that's as agile and flexible as a public alternative. But you're going for scale, Big obviously. Time. It's not, sure. a, it's not, it's not a single rack or a single box. Wikibon's not, not buying this thing. Not this year, soon. but we're working but on we'll that. We'll get there. We, ha we have a thing called Switch Zero, which we'll talk to you about <laughs> a different day, which is the switchless switch. But anyway. Okay, all right, good. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. But so when you think about the TAM, um, how do you... How do you size this opportunity? It's, uh, it's very large. It's, it's basically data center uh, networking. Mm -hmm. So it's, depending on whose math you use, you know, 30, 40 billion dollar TAM. Um, it's, it's really, you know, if you look at, I mean, pretty clearly Cisco's dominant mm -hmm. and Arista's doing a phenomenal job, you know, really being the alternative in that market. And so, you know, we're the guy behind Arista by a few years and, and taking uh, a different architectural approach. Talk about the channel a little bit. We were talking, you know, recently about that and how there's big changes, and it's, it's driven by cloud. Obviously, open source is changing you know, the whole pricing structure of our industry, but how do you see the channel evolving? You know, you've got the guys who move boxes. Mm -hmm. That's sort of you know, the historical sweet spot. I presume you're not skating backwards. <laughs> um, talk about your channel strategy, channel partners, your ecosystem that you're building out. What do you see in there? So um, that's, a, that's a big part of this year, actually. So it's really great, uh, really great questions. Um, so last summer we signed Arrow as our master distributor, and <clears throat> there's no accident that we did that. And um, you know, Arrow actually partners with a lot of the other technology companies that we that we're working with, whether it be you know Nutanix or Cloudera or Hortonworks. So that there's a new ecosystem of technologies that Arrow wants to bring to market to enable these cloud builders. So so the cloud builder customer isn't consuming um, you know 
uh, just a, a Cisco switch or an EMC array or a NetApp box. They don't buy that way. They're not, they're not just looking for best of breed product. And the partners are now reflecting that. So there, there's this move away from the classic box pusher, right? I'm an EMC VAR, I'm a Cisco VAR. Um, they, to, to us, they would look more like a system integrator because they think more about the application and the use case and less about the physical infrastructure. They would approach it more from the top down. And so they're trying to solve a business problem and use the right technology to solve the problem. And so they're less about, you know, I'm a Cisco CCIE as I am, um, I need to scale uh, a VMware environment from 20,000 to 40 to 100,000 VMs. And how do I do that? How do I have an elastic uh, VMware environment that I can stretch geographically and reduce my operating expense? They think, you know, data center uh, in as opposed to component up. It's a very, very different. So this cloud builder concept that you guys have been talking about is interesting. Yeah. So what, what, are, what are the attributes of that persona? Is it, a, <laughs> is it an architect? Is it an infrastructure person? Is it an apps person? Yeah, so they're, they're, we, 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 we've named them and uh, we actually have a list of uh, attributes, uh, which I won't go into all of them. I don't give away all of our secrets. <laughs> but um, they think really top down. The, the, probably the single biggest thing is um, they think top down about the infrastructure. That they, they think about flexibility and agility. They think, I'm, I'm an architect, I'm a data center architect, I'm a cloud architect. They go by several names that are all related, that we just call them all kind of cloud builders. Mm -hmm. um, they can be an enlightened networking guy that kind of gets the idea that this hierarchical static network is not really meeting his needs. That, um, that, you know, um, that the, the scalability horizontally of his user's requirements, if they're, if they're you know, Horton, Hortonworks or Cloudera, that that network topology is not optimized for that east-west traffic. That there's you know, these network architects that aren't just skilled in kind of understanding uh, Cisco CLI commands and protocols, but understand the real nature of what a network represents. And what a network represents is an ability to enable applications to do what they need to do, right? Which means I need to meet my SLA. I need to have low latency. I need to, um, I need to have extremely high throughput. I need to be able to meet these thresholds of SLAs or the applications will then start reacting to the lack of the infrastructure being able to meet their SLA, which ends up potentially causing pathological problems because the applications then start moving applications and data around to work around the fact the infrastructure is behind them. And that can get pathological. So what if you could tell the infrastructure to reshape itself? That's a very, very powerful notion. Mm. And, and because behind all this is the business impact. That's right. Right, which is either. You know, uh, you, you probably have enough bandwidth in your network. The problem is it's stuck in a cable over there. <laughs> you know, so this is part of the problem with the networking guy. I, I have enough bandwidth in my network. I have, you know, a terabit network. Well, that's great, but it's short Give me some. <laughs> Give me some. The problem is where I want to go, yeah. it's congested. It's no different than saying, if I'm going between here and New York City, if I take the wrong route, I'm going to hit traffic. And then everybody else tells you, well, I didn't go on the mass bike. I took 95, and, and they didn't hit any traffic. Well, they were on the wrong road. Tough, right? What if you could know that? That's really the essence of what we do. We can move the bandwidth around to solve your business problem. You probably bought enough bandwidth. It needs to be flexible. The ways of, of networking. The ways of networking. <laughs> we talked about this last time. All right, so um, do you, talk about the, the market a little bit. I mean, you just did a, did a raise. It's not easy to raise money these days. Mm -hmm. You're seeing that. Uh, you know, you go out to Silicon Valley a lot. I do as well. VCs are tightening up. B rounds are really, really difficult right now. You got to be pleased. You got a you know, big investor, big name investor. Yep. Um, talk about you know, what you're seeing in the space, how you guys are doing, and just in terms of you know, funding, what's next for you? Sure. So, um, I mean, I think we may have talked about this last time. I'm always raising money, so it's just mm -hmm. the nature of what we do. CEOs. Uh, so that's what we do. Job, right? Right? So whether it be, you know, this quarter, next quarter, uh, I actually talked to an investor today. Uh, so there's a, the good news is a lot of people following us now, which is great. Uh, so we will continue. To, we will do another raise this year. Um, and you should raise when you don't need it, and we don't need it, so we'll raise. Mm -hmm. and that's pretty simple. Um, the, um, uh, the market for capital... Uh, is tight, tighter, right? Um, what they want to see is results, right? There's been a lot of stories about SDN and other things. So I think we're past that. The trough of disillusionment is almost over. And some of us have actually figured out actually how to monetize these things. And so those guys that do that and solve real problems will be successful and raise. Um, the, um, the challenge now is to really perfect the go-to-markets and that's where we're really focused, so. What's your headcount now? 
Uh, we're we're still under 100. We didn't really disclose that, but we yeah. were like 90 people. We're okay, not a lot. We never we never really grew too fast. Um, we were ramping sales, but you know until we see opportunities in different markets, we don't hire, right? So we're very judicious about that. Um, and uh, so we, you know, when I first joined, we had offices in several different places. We shut them all down uh, because it just wasn't prudent. And I uh, don't regret any of that. I wish we had presences in some of these places now, but you know, I can always rent the conference room for meetings. So. so you got a beehive going in New Hampshire. Yep. Right, but and it's substantial. It's substantial. Yeah. And then we have uh, some guys on the West Coast, mm -hmm. our partner engineering group, which does a lot of these integrations that we're talking about, whether it be uh, you know, Hortonworks or Nutanix uh, or VMware or Next Up is uh, open, actually open. Stuff. And you've done some stuff with Cloudera as well. We've right? done some stuff with Cloudera actually, yeah. So it, that having that point of presence out there from the development side is really important to us because that's where a lot of the technology partners are. Okay, so it's kind of a bi-coastal, you know, ratchet game here. Is yeah, that what we yeah. Would expect the right skill out there. Um, you know, we'd love to expand to closer into Cambridge, but there's no plans to do that right now, given the current climate. Well, but I mean, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty right now, and you guys have, you know, pretty strong vision. So you must be able to attract, you know, certain people. I know New Hampshire maybe is a little tougher than than Palo Alto, but Palo Alto is so competitive. You know, with with regard to salaries and so forth, so it's a balance, right? I mean, no, I mean, especially the skill sets that we go after. I mean, especially now that you know we're several years in, and there's actually some very interesting projects coming up as parts of our system that we're actually rewriting now. And since we have such strong talent, uh, and and the architecture is very well defined, it's easier to get developers now to kind of work on a piece because it's like, oh, I can I can own this piece. So it's not hard to attract talent, and mm -hmm. uh, so we've been pretty fortunate. And it's what the talent you're looking for is what systems expertise. It's is, really is software. Um, you know the, you know the, the prototypical background is kind of operating systems, but they don't really almost teach that in school anymore, yeah. <laughs> right? So, so think about connect this API to this API. Those are the guys we want, and languages don't matter. Any engineer worth his salt can, you know. Sadly, I don't speak Italian, but I I did program in C, Ada, Bliss. COBOL, PL1, 68,086, 6502, VAX, MIT, Alpha. I know a lot of languages. <laughs> so languages are not a problem for any real engineer, right? So we're not hung up on that. What we're hung up on is guys that really want to change the world, that believe in the vision, and that will just crank, right? Learn from more seasons, guys. So we've had no problem attracting that 6502. Talent. Yeah. Rockwell. 6502. <laughs> I did work stuff. in that, yeah. So, okay, so uh, you're going to raise money this year. Other things that we should be looking for, um, you, you, uh, uh, selectively targeting you know, sales growth, right? That's selective targeting sales growth, kind of leading the, the sales charge as we expand. Right. Um, we, um, we're engaged in a lot of you know, OEM conversations uh, around you know, how do we deliver in, in, in integrated offers. So there's a bunch of that going on. We're, uh, we have some very interesting data center partnerships uh, going on, a company called Aligned uh, Energy that's uh, building kind of next generation data centers, highly elastic data centers, extremely power efficient, and their model is that they have some very interesting uh, power and cooling technology that allows them to have what's called linear PUE, so very efficient data centers as they fill and so they're very disruptive in the business model because you only pay for what you use in the data center. You don't buy so many square feet and pay for it over four years. You pay for exactly what you use and they can do that because they have key enabling technology. And, and they looked around for a networking partner and they need a network that's extremely elastic where they can control the traffic in the data center. And who does that? That's right. kind of what we were born to do. Right. So they program our network to deliver, uh, to deliver bandwidth in their data center dynamically. It's a kind of partnership made in heaven. Nice. And uh, really good guys, and they're growing pretty quickly. So you'll see announcements around those kinds of things uh, as we roll forward. And um, you know, so we're so you know, data center guys, uh, some service providers more globally. But the big focus for us is uh, financial services and uh, and government. Any events that we can find yet this year? Or what, uh, we're not doing a lot of events. Plans? We're okay. doing local uh, things. So Arrow's our partner. So we're yeah. doing a lot of regional stuff yeah. where our partners bring their customers, and we go to lunch and learns. Very focused tactically on the street stuff. We're, right. we're not doing a lot of events. We'll attend events generally and have meetings around them, mm -hmm. but uh, we generally don't do a lot of events. That's interesting. So you're finding much more productivity out of these sort of surgical strikes with so partners. So work with Arrow, recruit the partner, have an event, bring their customers in, maybe a couple, you know, have work with Arrow to do that, you know, bring in a guest speaker, blah, 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 mm -hmm. have an event, get focused time with them, and then, you know, prospect, prospect in a very focused way. 
Well, Rich, I'm not surprised that uh, you're on the track that we expected. It's only been 18 months, but uh, you can see you guys are really setting into a, a groove swing here. So congratulations, and uh, we'll be watching. Looking for, for more great things from Plexi. Thanks for coming on. Thanks. Always a pleasure. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. This is Cube Conversations. This is Dave Vellante. We'll see you next time.